Okay, so today we are starting to speak about, uh, let's say that we are starting to speak about multimodal interaction and a little bit uh, something that is post WIMP. So we are entering in this second phase uh, of the course. Uh, and, and we will, for, for a moment, for a few weeks, abandon the, the process that we are following. We will go back to, to that uh, for the evaluation towards the last weeks of the course, but we open here a, a parenthesis about something a little bit more uh, advanced or different from, from, from the process and the basic things that we have seen up to now. And, and today, and just for today, we are starting, we are speaking about designing for diversity because this is a nice introduction for multimodal interaction and different uh, abilities, different senses that we can use to interact with a, a computer system, any computer system. And for multimodal interaction, I mean that we can use maybe speech plus uh, a graphical user interface, so a screen for interacting with a computer and or, or a computerized system. So putting together different abilities, different senses to, to communicate and to, uh, to communicate in both direction with a computer or a system or an application. And, and this also is also post WIMP because we don't have, typically when we do speech, for instance, we don't have the, the mouse, the pointers, all the menus and all these, uh, these items here. But, but today we will start again speaking about principles and guidelines, and then we will move next week onto more uh, practical, say, or maybe interesting, I don't know, things. Uh, so today the lecture is called the Designing for Diversity. And let's, let me make a, a brief recap. So what we should know up to now. So up to now, we, we know obviously that it's important to design for the user to follow a human-centered process. And, and we did follow this, this process uh, for, for the course, for your uh, projects. Uh, so we, we followed the co uh, a process in which we extracted some needs from the user. We selected a target population, children, uh, people with diabetes, uh, actors or whatever. And we extracted some needs while these people are doing some, some activities. And we partially discovered while doing these activities and also in the course, uh, what I say that people are a mess because people are really different. Again, they have different abilities, they have different weaknesses. They come from different background and culture. And we, and we have a group this year that is exploring how foreign people are cooking Italian food. So really also different background and culture come in in this, in this picture. And also people have different interests you notice when you do when you did your need finding activities, different viewpoints, different experience, different needs. And even if we let's say target a specific population like children or people with diabetes or something or actors and so on, they have also different ages, different sizes, different abilities again. And so all, all these things put together, uh, that will be all these things that put together have an impact obviously on the way in which a person use an application, use a system, and indeed on whether they can use it at all, this application. And these and this needs and these abilities and these differences can be permanent, like a person who born uh, with diabetes or um, temporary, or evolving in, in time. So ages is something that change every time, every year. So we, we should consider this while designing and then implementing our application, obviously in the net finding phase, but also in the other phases or, or not, the how, and which are the things that we should consider the most. So, when we think about, so you are now designing a paper prototype. So with object buttons, text label and so on, you are imagining how people interact 
people in your target population will interact with this. And what we typically do uh, naturally, let's say, is designing these kind of things for people like us. So we typically tend to use our own abilities as starting point so that uh, things are easy for us or for people like us or for our friends that maybe are similar to us. But this could be also difficult for everyone else. And if we just use our own abilities, what I can see, my gender, my age or a range of my age, my language ability, my tech literacy, my physical ability, my time availability or the absence of it, or access to technology, high speed internet and so on and so on, we end up in general designing system for people like us and without considering that other people could be obviously different from us for a lot of reasons, for a very small number of reasons, temporary or not. So we should uh, consider in a way that normal does not exist. The average user is something that we sometimes say, okay, this is for the average user is able to use it, uh, but it's not something that is as a strong match in let's say in the real world. Uh, because all the interaction with design with technology or our interaction with technology uh, strongly depend on what we can understand, remember, but also see, hear, say, and touch together this thing, not separately. Because these, these are, and I'm not speaking only about uh, people with disabilities being the very serious disabilities like motor disabilities, permanent disabilities, or, or more lightweight uh, cognitive disabilities that maybe impede, have some difficulties in understanding some kind of things. I, I'm, I, I'm also obviously speaking about, about those uh, people, but also we should consider that these uh, things may happen uh, in our life. Maybe not all of them, but a lot of them, because uh, as we as typically say, life happens sometimes and we don't have full control on, on those things. So designing application, designing system, designing user interface, designing interactive way to, to use a computer, assuming that all the senses see, hear, say, and touch, and the related abilities are fully enabled all the time means ignoring several people. And so we really want that our design reflect that this diversity. That is, again, not only diversity about people with disability, but this of diversity that reflect gender, reflects age, reflect context, re reflect temporary situation, reflects a lot of uh, con cultural um, assumption that we may have. Uh, and so way of doing things in a country with respect to another and, and so on. So this, this picture is uh, to me quite emblematic. This picture here, uh, the laser pointer is here. This picture is, is taken from uh, um, a toolkit by Microsoft Design. And it show you that for some of the senses, the abilities, the main abilities, it, it ignored the cognitive part, but we can imagine something like this also for the cognitive. It show for uh, ever disabilities, uh, some situation uh, that are temporary, permanent or situational. So if you, for instance, design a system uh, that heavily rely on speech, like a uh, Google Assistant or Siri or something like that. And, and this is maybe the, the main or the only way of interacting with the system or with specific parts of the system. And that is the only way to interacting or again, the main way of interacting. You are excluding some people. You are obviously excluding all the person that cannot speak. So like people with disability that, has non that, that are not non-verbal and, and, and it's one side, but you can also, you also exclude people uh, which have temporary impediment on speaking, like people with laryngitis or 
that cannot pronounce well words because they have maybe they, they get the flu and they don't have a lot of voice or people with heavy accent so your system is able to recognize british english very very well and the the, the italian accent of english is instead not to recognize so the system is not working it, you are not able to have this system working with for your user and so you see that here you are just not excluding uh, maybe a small population non-verbal people with disability but you are also excluding uh, potentially a lot of other group of people that may have temporary or situational uh, impediments to use the system with speech and, and the same happens just for example for seeing or touch. If you have a, a system that rely on touch uh, on both hands, for instance, you can you exclude obviously people that maybe have one arm only, but you also exclude people that have an injury that broke their, their arm. That is again temporary, maybe for one month, they cannot use fully your system because your system require maybe great gesture in the hair, like a Kinect or something like that. But you're also excluding maybe new parents because they have a child uh, with them. And so they cannot use fully your both hand to do activities. And same things, and then we move on is for seeing if your graphical user interface is just visual and you don't provide any help for not visual interaction with your, or any support for your visual interaction, uh, with your application, you are again excluding blind people or people that have some difficulties to see, but you're also excluding people with cataract, even if maybe they are not maybe in your target population, but people with other kind of uh, issue uh, in in the highs. Or, but also you can uh, exclude people like a distracted driver. So you imagine to have an application, uh, a visual application that require to interact visually, to see what happens and react according to what happens mostly. And, and you're in a car and you're driving, so you're focused on the street, you're focused on the instruments of the car, you're focusing what happens while driving. And if this application require you to look at it deeply and focus, you uh, get distracted from driver driving and you can, can cause problem uh, to you and harm also other people. And so these are all, all, all cases or situation in which normal, a person with all senses and ability fully enabled all the time does not really exist. Because again, there are the permanent situation that are related to disability, but there are also this temporary and situational context that <clears throat> may happen because obviously you, everybody can have a broken arm or on a ear infection, or being in a very crowded uh, place where you cannot speak with your computer or with your laptop or with your smartphone, and you cannot hear the, the results, uh, the, hear the sounds from, from, the old, from your system, for your computer. And this also applies to cognitive issues as well. Maybe you are you are you can have some kind of let's say disability that uh, that are pertaining to the cognitive part, so the understanding, remember things. But maybe you are just an uh, elderly person, or maybe you're just really really tired, in a, or uh, had a very really bad day, or slept uh, bad for several days in a row, and so you are you are you are compromised from that that things and. If, you're, if the application that I'm going to use, the system that I'm going to use is really uh, relying on all these abilities, full abilities all the time, this could be problematic. So how we can design for avoiding to excluding people? And here today, I'm going to present you uh, two design methodologies that are, that are, let's say that they have the same goal but they try to reach the goal in different perspective with different path. And these are obviously some of these, the things that we are going to see, some of the principle that we are going to see uh, have a strong match with what we already saw, with what we already 
uh, have done because they are principled and they are most, most of them reasonable. But for, in some cases, they reflect on some specific aspects that we didn't consider with really care up to now. So all, all these things are tools that you can use and methods, tools, principles that you can use, put together and to, to, to create, not in this course maybe, but in, in life, you need to create a product, a, an application, a system to be deployed to people to create something that is really uh, inclusive as much as possible. So the first uh, methodology that I, I will show you and with the three related principle is the inclusive design. And inclusive design is a design methodology that enables and draws on the full range of this human diversity that is not only, again, abilities, physical abilities or cognitive abilities, but also gender and so on. And this methodology starts from the idea to including learning people from all these range of perspective. In a way, the inclusive design means designing a diversity way to participate so that everyone has a sense of belonging. It's not a one size fit all approach. It's not that I'm designing this application or this set of feature and everybody, and that is usable by everybody. All, for all people in the world can use it, no matter, they don't need a special tool, they don't need a special instruments, they don't need anything, just they can use it from day one. Uh, this is not that, that kind of thing. So that is not an approach to say, I'm creating something that is usable and accessible and perfect from the beginning, let's say from the design phase, from the start of the design phase to solve all the needs in one size. It's more a one size fits one. So it's more designing a system or a portion of a system or an application for a specific use case for an edge case and then extending it a little bit to other. So I'm designing for uh, people who cannot see and then I can extend it for people that have temporary impediment in seeing or situational problem in seeing. And then I'm thinking about who am I excluding as so I'm excluding people who can see, but I can also exclude people who, who cannot hear and I'm designing solutions, maybe integrated in a platform, integrated in a system, but I'm designing specific solution for solving that specific use case. I'm not creating a unique system for everybody in, on the planet. So again, inclusive design is not a one size fit all, but is more designing a system or a portion of a system or an application or a product or whatever you want so that, it, uh, that that allow that expose a diversity of way, a diversity of uh, interaction modality, a diversity of input and output system, a diversity of things to participate so that everyone feels included and can use the application and can access to the application to the system to, to whatever it is. Uh, inclusive, the inclusive design start was born in the digital world. So start from the digital world, then it could also be applied to the real world, to the built environment, but start from in the digital world. So it's native from the digital world. And inclusive design as another feature, let's say that different to the other uh, methodology that I'm going to, to present you, to you today, that is universal design. Um, for inclusive design, there is no standard definition. There, are, there is not a shared set of principles and practices that the world say that is that are aligned within. So here we, we rely on, on, given there are a lot of different principles and practices, uh, obviously the definition is more or less the same and the idea, the founding idea is more or less the same. So this one size fits one approach and so on. Uh, since there are not shared practices and principle, we rely here today uh, on a recent definition of practices by Microsoft Design that you can also find to that website. And Microsoft Design essentially say that the inclusive design has three, three principles. Hmm? Uh, three principles that say that inclusive design is more focused on how you can come to a solution, how you designer, how you creator can come to a solution. Then the 
characteristics or the quality or the nature of that solution. It's more focused on how you reach that specific solution than not examining the solution to include a series of characteristics or qualities according to some rules. And these three principles of inclusive design are, the one is light, uh, recognize exclusion. So starting by asking, uh, as observing what you are building, you are designing and asking yourself, who are we excluding from using it? And again, sometimes exclusion happens when we don't pay attention to our biases or because we consider that, uh, for instance, like Italians, that all people in the world behave like Italians. That is obviously not true. Um, and also exclusion may happen in a temporary, as, as we said before, or situational way. So just for one month because you broke your arm or, uh, or just in a specific context, like very crowded uh, places for speech and audio, for instance. So first of all, asking yourself, this is a principle again. So uh, connecting to the principle that we, we already saw in this course, they are quite high level, not high level like theories, but no low level specific like guidelines. They are still principle for a methodology of design. So the first principle say recognize exclusion. So ask yourself, my system, my user application, my products, my whatever, that I'm currently building, I'm starting to build or I'm completing towards the end of its completion, and it's almost ready to be deployed, is excluding some, somebody who? This is the first question. The second question, the second principle say instead, uh, learn from diversity. So put people at the center of the design process from day one, and this is something that we already heard a lot of time, but not only, put people at the center, not only extract need from the people, but also try to imagine uh, how a person we can, with a given set of ability would use a system or work system. And try to observe these people, this person using uh, a system or a specific system. So after identifying who are we excluding, let's uh, observe in which sense are we excluding this person and what this person can do now with our system, what cannot do. And we can obviously try to imagine this, but it's not always uh, simple to imagine this. Uh, in some cases for let's say disabilities, it's maybe easier uh, to imagine how uh, an interface or to evaluate, evaluate how an interface can be used by a blind person because there are some technical solution to, to check this, this very specific uh, ability, but we cannot imagine all the situational emotional uh, context, what happens while they're using the application. Because again, as in the example of the car before, if you are, it's really different to use the application uh, while driving or while in a car or the same application or uh, in a crowded place or while relaxing at home. So the focus that you have in the application, the noise around you, is really different in very different contexts. So try to learn, not, not only the need finding, pro, the need finding phase, but also after identifying the need uh, and also after proposing a solution for that need, try to think and to observe and to extract uh, and to learn from various aspects of diversity. And then the third principle is Solve for one, extend for too many. As we said before, uh, you can solve a problem for a person that is blind, but this solution can be extended to many other people that are temporary blind or situational blind or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, three principles. First, recognize exclusion. Second, learn from the diversity, especially after recognizing exclusion, and, ter and third, solve for that specific edge case and extend a little bit the solution to many, because many can use that uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the good. And connected to, to this, uh, this, this last point, solve for one, extend to many, 
there is this beauty of constraint, like this designing for, for this one, but typically this one are the most, uh, let's say problematic case, the edge case, the most specific case, like people with permanent disabilities, that in some cases, designing for people with permanent disability can seems like a significant constraint. Oh yes, I, I, now my application should be useful uh, and accessible by people who are blind. And now from by people who are hard of hearing, why you should care and it's, it's decent to care, but which impact has this on my application? How much work should I spend? Maybe uh, the, the, the idea is that I don't really want to spend too much time because it's not my target population or is, is maybe just a couple of people in my target population is not the majority. And so I, I don't want to spend time and resources on this. But again, thinking that we are solving for one and extending for many, uh, and also with the example that we, we men I mentioned before, uh, we can say that if to design for a specific case and a hard case, the resulting design, the resulting solution can benefit a more, a more large, a much larger number of people. And, and we have plenty of example in our life uh, about this, about something, about system, about feature that were designed and fought for specific people, specific abilities, and then now are used by a, a large part of the population. So for instance, closed captioning, so captioning uh, in videos, for instance, was created for the hard of hearing community was not creative for the general population. Absolutely. And, and so it was specifically designed for solve a need in that specific population, how to enable people who cannot listen to watch a video and listen, or, uh, or let's say, listen, read an audiobook and, and so on. And so all, all this thing was creating for that specific with some very specific constraint, you cannot use, like you cannot hear at all. But now if you imagine, uh, maybe you always, maybe in some cases, watch videos on YouTube with caption on, because maybe the, 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 the room is crowded or there is some noises or there are other people in the room and you cannot uh, have everybody listen to your, to your videos or you are in a crowd place and it can be used for reading, for listening, uh, some, some multimedia uh, topic, or to teach a, ch a child how to read, maybe in English, where, when you have a different pronunciation with respect to what is written. So having somebody that is pronounced the word and also there is written the word can help how to read and how to pronounce also. So it could be really useful for a lot of other cases, also in the general population as well. And again, this is something that was born for solving a specific problem in a specific community that are people hard of hearing. But, but the same apply if you think about remote control, about automatic door openers, about audiobooks, as I said before, all these things were born out of solving a problem in a specific uh, community with maybe people with a specific set of disabilities or abilities. And now we are used to them and we also maybe appreciate an automatic door opener instead of opening a door. Because again, it could be useful in, in a lot of temporary or situational context. So let's make an example of this, the application of these three um, principle. So let's imagine that we are creating a video game for a console like the PlayStation or the Xbox. Uh, like, you don't know, there is a charter that is jumping, running, collecting item, I don't know, or, or maybe it's a game for driving cars, uh, like needs for speeds or, or something like that. So according to the principle, the first things that uh, we should ask ourselves is, uh, so given that all these, sorry, given that all, all these action jumping, running are time sensitive and maybe you are using controller, if it's a console, uh, it can require fine motor skill, not to perform the, the, the action per se, but maybe to compete 
with other people, hmm? to run faster, to complete the mission before other people, to uh, drive in a competition and uh, be the first one to, to, to complete the, the race and so on. And, and this could be quite fine motor squeal because you need to press button on a, on, a, on a controller and quickly press this button and maybe they are close each other and you have to press the right one. So things that probably we all have an idea of how they, they work. So according to the principle, the first question that we are asking is who are we excluding in creating a video game for driving in a race competition with a controller? And possible follow-up question. And if you have any other follow-up question or ideas, you can write on the chat and I will include and discuss them as well while I'm reading this. Uh, so for instance, we can, we are, are who are we, we excluding? We can exclude people with limited mobilities so that they're not able to do this fine control that is our edge case. But if you think we can also exclude people who never played a video game before or that type of video games before or use that specific console before uh, because maybe they are not able, they don't have the finer, the fine motor skill, the ability to compete in this game and won the race quickly. They maybe needs month or need some help or like people with mobility actually that for competing and winning a race, obviously we, we, can, we, we can provide them some help in some cases, some way. And also which contest should, should we consider uh, for the specific people that we are excluding? We are excluding people that live together. And so they are playing, maybe they can play together in the same room, or we are excluding people maybe with limited mobility that are alone and our game can only be accessed uh, through the internet. Hmm? And again, which of them, if we are really creating this video game, can we observe? Can we, but well, maybe not in this specific moment, but uh, in, in general, which of them can we observe while playing with a video game like ours or with ours video games uh, to see which problem they have, to, to see which needs they have? Yes, also maybe we're excluding people who don't have competent knowledge. If it's a higher plane simulator or it's let's say maybe it's a higher airplane. This is a question from, I'm saying this for, for people that are seeing, this, watching this video after. And this is a question from the chat, maybe who doesn't have specific competent knowledge like in a airplane simulation. So yes, that could also be a, a portion of population that we are excluding, maybe a, a not, a, not a lot of people, but we are excluding some, somebody. And in addition, if this is not an airplane simulation, but is an airplane race, then this is, this is again related to never played a video game before like this and the, the, the competent knowledge. And then we, we have a message in the chat to say, but in this time uh, of game, a first, a first bot, uh, so the first start of the game, typically they have a good tutorial that can teach the basis. So yes, this is maybe a possible solution uh, for the competent knowledge. Maybe is it's not enough. In, in the simulator case, it could, uh, could be good. You can, you can also explain technical terms during the tutorial, but you should also not to waste uh, three hours for a tutorial to explain everything. And again, remember the example, we are speaking for, for instance, in this example, in a video game to compete. So it's not just a simulator for, uh, so if you want to imagine the flight simulator, not just a simulator for uh, simulating a flight uh, with his, uh, when, when a person want, but just also to compete or to reach some goal or to win some prize or to end the war. So uh, there is also this competition part in this, in this, in this example, obviously not, not in the real world. So these are all possible questions about who are we excluding? That is the first principle. And then obviously we should learn from people, observe people 
and so on. And this is the second, the second question. And in the third one, a third principle say how we can uh, solve for one of these, for instance, people who are limited mobilities, something that could be beneficial for other. So for instance, a possible solution could be having a co-pilot mode. Hmm? Uh, so we are setting a specific context, people that share the same room or something like that. And a co-pilot mode could allow two games controller to work together so that two people can control the same charter, car, airplane, or, or whatever. And way co-pilot so that an advanced or skilled or expert player can play together with somebody somebody that needs more assistance. And so it, it may be help in turn. So now you can play, you can pilot the, the, the fly, the, the airplane, you can drive the car. In other case, it's too difficult for now. And you can switch the, the, the more advanced player can switch the control or they can play together. So there are different scenarios. But this is a way, for instance, to solving a possible solution for a video game that requires fine motor skill to compete. We are obviously excluding all these people. People never played a game before, people with limited possibility. And a copyleft mode could be useful for uh, minimizing at least some of the issues. Uh, or removing at all so, or some of the issues. So this co-pilot mode could be one solution. And this open gaming of our specific uh, fictionary game to various kinds of people. Obviously people with disabilities, also temporary injuries that cannot use uh, quickly uh, as always a controller, but also novice gamer that could be uh, accompanied by people. They can, be, uh, they can have a person more expert that teach them the, the strategies, the secrets the, that show them that they have to press uh, maybe uh, faster than these or do this action and the others, kids as well. And also people who would just want to play together without competing with other, uh, because maybe the expert is one that's competing and for the, the this lower part, you can have the other that is playing again, the, the flighting, the, the, the airplane or driving the car and so on. So you are with just a possible solution like a copilot mode for uh, maybe people with limited mobility in fine grain control. So just fine movements, not large movements. You also open this game to various kinds of people, different situation. So this is the, the main idea behind the inclusive design. Design for somebody and then that are currently excluded and then extend it to all various other people that can benefit as well of this feature or these functionalities. And this happens not to be just as an example uh, for, for a fictional example, but this is something that the Microsoft did for the Xbox One uh, in which they introduced this co-pilot mode for that specific reasons by solving the specific problem. So you can, in the option of the Xbox, you can turn on and off this copilot and having two people using this controller, the Xbox controller, play together in this modality. So there is an expert, let's say player together with a non-expert or with, with a player that is more difficult. And this is solving this specific problem. It could be beneficial. It could be, it obviously is a set of feature inserted in a much more complex system because it's not, uh, in our example was in a game, here is inserted at the level of the Xbox. So potentially is useful and used by all the games that run on the Xbox platform. So this is not an application per se, it's not a system per se, it's just a feature or a set of feature related to the application, but a feature that apply to maybe many games of this, of the console. And so it could be uh, beneficial to various application moving it to let's say a, a system level. But, but the idea is the same, adding something or more, more changing something in a, an application, a system in a part of a feature in a complex system to solve a specific need. And here the specific need is people with limited uh, 
motor fine fine control, motor fine control, and uh, for playing competitive game for which maybe they, they need some some need some help. So now let's do this this game again. Let's ask again, uh, who are we excluding now? With this copilot mode, are we excluding somebody or not? So one person, one one thing that came to my mind is that uh, we are excluding for gaming uh, people who cannot use this. Who cannot not only have the fine motor capability to use the game, but they cannot have the motor capability to use this. And so, can we apply this again and? create a copilot to, to uh, for also solving this? Uh, well, actually, Microsoft did this for the Xbox, and, and this is not an advertisement for, for Microsoft for the Xbox in general, but it, these are really nice things that they, they did. So it's, it's, used, it's, it's interesting to, to examine also this. Uh, and this is quite specific for the Xbox. So this, uh, this, this idea is very nice. And so they say, yes, you, you cannot use this controller, uh, but, and so you cannot play games, but you can use this. So this is an adaptive controller. It's yes, yeah, some of the button of the, of the original controller like this, for instance. And you also have two big buttons here. So for people that have uh, not limited the capabilities and as a series of ports here to, to connect other devices like this button here, these are only buttons which you can press it and the sense if you are pressing it or releasing it and, and other kind of uh, instrument, uh, maybe for speech or maybe for controlling something with the movement of the head. So something that is adaptive to, to the user and this adaptive controller that is sold separately from the Xbox uh, works also with the copilot mode. So you can have, let's say a person that is the expert user using the controller and maybe the person that has some motor disabilities uh, using this controller in the copilot mode and work together and play together. So you see this and this also work without the copilot mode. So you, if you, if you have these, you can, uh, and you are a person with some motor disabilities, you can use this also to play some of the games of the Xbox. Maybe not, not all, because it depends uh, of the timing of the game, but this could be useful also for that. And it could be also useful for other people because this is really a, a tool in which you can attach a lot of other sensors, actuators, buttons, switch controllers, so you can really, increase the capability, the input capabilities of the, of the system. And so you are not relied, you're not forced to just use this controller in your end, but you can have more space, more sensors, more uh, buttons, more things. So you can also create a different uh, game experience for you, and maybe in some specific context or in some a specific case again, temporary or situational. Obviously, all, all the stuff in the end of the day linked to specific action that the controller has, or linked to specific action that the Xbox allow you to do. You cannot do something that is not permitted by the the, the system itself. But it increases your space of input possibility, for instance, with respect to the single smaller controller. And in addition, this also enable, again, what we can, uh, um, what we can see uh, next week, enable also multi-channel possibility of using uh, things because you can have, again, multiple items, multiple modality to use the same controller. And we have a question, can the compiler to be considered to be an effective solution since it has the constraint of having at least two people instead of just one? So uh, I think so. I think it could be considered an effective solution. Uh, partially because if you have limited mobilities 
or if you are a novice player like a kids and never played a video game before you don't have the competencies for that you need a partner you need somebody probably that may help you in uh, uh, overcoming the problem uh, Yes, this does, the, the, the next comment there is yes, this doesn't solve the problem if the, the person is alone, obviously. Uh, but we can imagine, for instance, that the copilot mode could also work on the internet. That obviously adds another constraint that is having a good internet connection. So uh, probably there is not a perfect solution, but this, this, this is true also in, in general. But uh, we are working by approximation and we are working by so we're trying to uh, enabling things and obviously we, we have some constraint or we have some requirements in addition. So the pilot may uh, ask you to have two people uh, or two people on the internet and then you have the requirements to have a internet connection that probably for the Xbox is, is required as well. But yeah, it, it could be a uh, uh, but again, it's it's more. Uh, so I, I actually don't know if the copilot will work on the internet, but probably it could. I, I don't know. Um, but but actually, this is nice because Microsoft say said to to follow this inclusive process. So you can obviously refine every everything, trying to including much more people than before, and so not excluding people that are alone. And so you can add the internet and then you need to ex not exclude people that uh, doesn't have speed, uh, high speed internet and you can come up with another solution or can refine the existing solution. So it, it's a process of design based on principle like the process that we uh, have seen up to now. So it's, it's an iterative process by definition. Uh, so since we are speaking, uh, I mentioned to you um, people with disabilities maybe in your mind say th this question arise like are we speaking about accessibility or not which is the relationship between inclusive design and universal design that we are going to see uh, in the next slide uh, and accessibility so if, if you don't know accessibility is for is is a series of guidelines and standards and practices also to allow uh, any system uh, any application, uh, any artifact also in the real world to be accessible by everybody. Mm -hmm. It's not really, it's not focused on the usability or, mm, or, or, or other qualities. It's more related to uh, accommodating, adding things or accommodating uh, uh, solution to reduce or remove a barrier to engage with a system of product. So obviously accessibility, inclusive design, universal design are all under a big umbrella and are strongly connected. But uh, so when we are speaking about inclusive design and people with disabilities and universal design, we are obviously speaking also about accessibility, not only. The, the difference is that accessibility is more an attribute while these design methodologies are methods. Uh, accessibility is focused primarily on people with disabilities, not only, but primarily, and ensuring again that there are no barrier to serving them. Adding accommodation to solve a technical, physical, cognitive barrier so that they can engage with a system of product. Uh, while inclusive design also include other perspective uh, emotional, cultural, social differences. So for, for instance, there is uh, a tool, a system that is called GenderMug uh, that, that was created in the United States that uh, if you probably remember, uh, that is a software tool that analyze if a specific application, also software, also code could be, um, is, includes some biases in gender. So if you have a binary gender, male and female, uh, that check that your languages, your action, your procedure are not biased typically towards uh, the male gender. So it's not problematic for female. And this is a tool that has 
nothing to do with accessibility, but is something for promoting inclusivity because it's not just for uh, people with disabilities or a set of, ability, or a set of specific abilities. And so this is called the gender mug. Uh, and you can also uh, have more information about it if you look on the internet. It's something created in the United States. And it should be open source and free available uh, to check these things about gender biases um, in, in product, in interfaces, in et cetera. So inclusive design as a method will make probably at the end of the day, the system more accessible as a result, as we have seen the example of the Xbox, but it's not a process for meeting all the accessibility standard. Accessibility has some standard that are standard ISO that are in some international law that have some guidelines. So not principle guidelines, so more low level and you are not fulfilling guidelines and standards and laws by following, simply following a process according to, to principles. You can, you should include accessibility check. You should think about accessibility from a technical and a guideline point of view while creating the system, but it's not something that is included in in inclusive design or universal design is something that is obviously strongly related, uh, but and inclusive design again will make the system more accessible, but it's not a process for checking and meeting all the accessibility standards and the guidelines. Also because they are really on two level difference. One, the design is the design method is a method based on principle. The other is a set of norms, is a set of guidelines, is a set of standards. So obviously there are some there are some point of contacts but there are also, also some really different and, and and finally accessibility and inclusive design obviously work together and should work together to make experience that are not compliant with standards not just filling a checkbox okay this is done this is done this is done but then it's terrible and not usable by everybody but yeah it respects it's normally very respect accessibility standard but it's usable for everybody. And an example of this, one of the uh, accessibility uh, recommendation, for instance, for the web, since we are working on the web, is that all the image should have uh, an alternative text. So that a blind person or a person that use a tool for reading the screen without seeing the screen, and this tool are called screen reader, uh, can understand not only the text that is in your web page, but also obviously the image in your web page. So if you add an alternative text to every image in your web page on your web application, whatever, you are compliant with the standard. You're compliant with the guideline to say, put an alternative text. But then if you have uh, an image and the alt text is empty or is uh, something like this is the alternative text, or something meaningless like this, you are you are compliant with the standard, obviously, and you are complying with the guidelines. So the check is passed, but uh, you are not really creating something that is usable because if you have a complex graph and the description is this is a graph, you are not really providing information for people that cannot read, cannot see the the graph that is on the screen. So. These are things that work together. Universal design. So remember that inclusive design is about uh, one size fits one approach. Universal design instead is a one size fit all approach. So for universal design, you have to design interactive system that are usable by anyone with any range of abilities using any technology platform. This is the goal of the universal design methods and the principle of universal design reflect this. So this is again, not focusing on edge cases and trying to stand a solution to the person that can benefit, but is, it's more like let's do something that can be usable by everybody in the same exact way. So without adding specific tool, without adding uh, a different input modalities, just something that is the same for everybody. So this is 
the, the main idea of universal design. Uh, and, and typically different from, from inclusive design, universal design is stronger at describing the qualities and the nature of a final design more than the process in which a designer or creator comes to that specific solution. And universal design sometimes does not involve the participation of some excluded communities more focused on abilities in particular. And another difference with inclusive design is that universal design was born for the physical world, for built environment. And we see a lot of example of universal design. We should see a lot of example of universal design in the built environment, uh, a little bit less in the digital world. Uh, but universal design can be obviously adopted in a digital world as it is, again, a set of principles that are quite general and quite high level. So universal design, inclusive design, accessibility are different approaches, different methods, a different level, but obviously they have similar goals and results. Even if different exist, they are tools in, to, in an arsenal to be used and in different contexts, in different situation, and they bring a different perspective to the same um, to the same area, to the same topic. That is again designing for diversity, for inclusion of uh, as much people as possible. And let me just open up another parenthesis uh, about universal design, inclusive design. In there are typically two school uh, of of thinking about universal design and inclusive design. There's one school that say universal design, inclusive design are actually the same thing. So they are synonyms. You can use, you can call it universal design and inclusive design and they are the same thing. And the other schools say, no, they are not the same things. You have a universal design that is a one size fits all platform uh, approach and inclusive design that is instead more focused on corner case and a little bit extension. Uh, just, just to give you this, this perspective, this, this information, just in case you, you are looking through, um, to, to the internet uh, about this thing, about these this terms. So here I, I'm, I'm following the, the project universal design and inclusive design are actually different. They are not tremendously different. They are not solving different goals, but they have some difference between them and they are both a useful methodology and they provide clever principles uh, in general. And differently from, from inclusive design, universal design has seven principles that are really, um, oh, seven principles that are really shared in general. So it's not something that everybody has its own version. These are the seven principles of universal design. And notice here just one difference. Uh, well, first of all, the, all, all the picture are, are related to the built environment and not to, to digital technologies, because again, pre universal design start from that. And universal design is primarily about trying to ensure that you don't not exclude anyone through the design choice you make. And obviously you make the design useful for everybody. But also notice what is written here, that the universal design, the principle are the design of products and environment to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So it's making really one thing that fits all. Uh, so the, the Xbox is something a little bit different because you have two controllers, for instance, one is maybe different from the other. So this is something that doesn't match really well with this universal design because the, the idea of universal design is you have a controller for, every, for everybody and everybody should use that controller. And so if you cannot use the controller, that controller is wrong, you should use, we should create a controller that is usable for everybody. And the seven principle of universal design uh, that apply, uh, some of them are really, you can imagine, you, can, you, you already remember some of them from other principles, like tolerance for errors, for instance, or flexibility, or simple intuitive use. They are similar to other principles that we have seen before. Other are a little bit more specific, like equitable use or size and space for approaching use. And you see here this example. This example are a good example of uh, universal design because here you have uh, automated door. Automated door 
are useful for everybody. Probably were designed for people on the wheelchair or cannot uh, move a handle uh, to open a door or don't have the strength to open an handle to, to push an, uh, a door, but they are useful for everybody when they work well. And so this is equitable use. One thing that is the same for everybody. So in universal design, you don't have the door for um, people without uh, issues in opening the door and then the door that is automatic for people that have some problem and then the door for people who are blind and so on. You just have the automatic door that serve all the needs for everybody. Uh, low physical efforts, another example. I'm just giving brief example here. So uh, the needs of an handle just that with low effort, with low strain, you can open a door and press the handle without having, without needing a fine control on, 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 on this thing and without needing the specific strength to do this. And also size and space, this is mostly for the physical world, the built environment, but size and space for approach and use. So if you are entering in a subway, you can have uh, entrance that are large enough for everybody. Why should you should, we should have small entrance and large entrance? Let's do the entrance open and large enough so that everybody can use it. Also considering those temporal situations, temporal context, the temporary context. So uh, a large things here could be useful for a person in a wheelchair, but also could be used by um, a family uh, with a child uh, or used by this man here that, well, let's imagine that he needs to enter in a, in a space like this. But if you carry on something, you can also use this additional space to, be, to, to move easier uh, with some bags, for instance, with you. So again, universal design is more about creating something that is as a universal use. And it's one thing that is can be used for everybody, not several things to answer several needs. And here we have two examples of universal design and inclusive design. So the first one is an example of universal design. You know what is this? For wheelchair. Yeah, but so in the chat is saying for wheelchair, yes, but we have say that is universal design. So it's for wheelchair, yeah, it's for coming up on a sidewalk. Uh, without stepping, no, the problem. Uh, without stepping on, uh, without stepping on the sidewalk, so easily. And this is fought for wheelchair, for we people with wheelchair. But this again could be useful if you have uh, uh, for basic riders, for people that broke their legs, for parents that carry on their the small children. And, and so they don't have maybe the ability to do the step because the step is high. So this is really universal design because this is useful for all. It's not something, so all the, the sidewalk could have, uh, yes, it does, um, I'm coming here. Um, uh, this is a really universal design because it's useful for really a lot of people. And in chat say it's not inclusive, it's not universal because there is no support for blind people. Instead there are, because you see this line here. These line here are for blind people, for the cane of blind people, because they can um, sense that the, the pavement is moving up and that this specific area, you know, this is not at the same level with the rest of the sidewalk he is moving in that direction. So they are also sensing this. So this picture here is not graphical. It, this, these lines are for helping people who are blind with the cane to know that here there is a, a way to step on the, the sidewalk and that is that shape and uh, is, is moving on. So all these things uh, are also useful for, uh, for, for really, this is a good example of universal design. Um, 
yeah, in the chat say I thought they should be should have been bigger, but yes, probably they are bigger, and it depends also from from the picture that you have. But mm, th these are really solving and covering a, a lot uh, of uh, of needs, not only people with disabilities, but also uh, people uh, in different contexts like bike riders and, and so on. So this is a good example of universal design, and here. I have an example of inclusive design that, it, well, if you want, you can watch the video. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's short. Basically, this is an eye tracker application for controlling, uh, quite old, for controlling uh, um, a smart environment, a smart home. Uh, so, so the user can look at these rooms here and enter in the room and then look at the, the lamp in the room and turn on the, the, the light only by using the, the eyes, so without touching the screen. And so this obviously was, this was thought for people with the uh, ASL, um, the, the entire isla, um, because they cannot move uh, at a certain stage of, their, of the disease, they cannot move at all. But eyes are one of the last things that they lose control. So they can use eyes for controlling things. And so eye trackers that map how you are looking uh, are, are really useful uh, for, as an instrument for this specific case. But this again could be in a sense inclusive design because you, you can also use this by touching the screen because buttons here and icons here are large enough for also touch screens. And actually this is also uh, a, touch, a, touch, a touch screen. So you can also use this by touching. So if you cannot, if you don't want or cannot, because you have very large glasses, for instance, or there is a wrong illumination in the room, or there are some problem, other people can use this also by touching or with mouse and keyboard. So this is uh, more example inclusive design because for instance, is not usable by uh, blind people, given, given that is a, a screen-based application in this specific case. Uh, but this is something that solves a specific need of a specific population that could be also useful for other tools. And again, they put together different channels, different modalities. You have high tracking, so you can look at things and, and things happen. So you can have a touch screen, you can have uh, and maybe some audio feedback if you want. So you can have mouse and keyboard, so you can have a, a lot of different way to interacting with this, uh, this application. So just, just towards the end, uh, a couple of information about accessibility, since we are spoken about, we have spoken about uh, principles and methodologies. Now let's have a look quickly at some guidelines and accessibility in particular that is part of this designing for diversity and designing for inclusion. In particular, let's have a look at accessibility and the web. Because, because the web is uh, quite popular, much, much more popular and used than maybe a desktop application. And because you are creating a prototype uh, with web technologies, so it, it could be easier to relate uh, concept from the web than not concept for the that apply to, let's say, uh, mobile phones or, or something else, hmm? or speech user interface, for instance. Uh, so, Unfortunately, despite the, grand, the great potential that the web have, may have also people with disabilities, uh, the potentiality of the web is largely unrealized today in 2020. Because today in 2020, some sites, some websites are still only useful, navigated, used by a mouse, by using a mouse. If you don't have a mouse, you cannot navigate in a website. So try, if you want, open a website, whatever you want, just don't use the mouse, use the tab key on your keyboard and enter key on your keyboard to select items in the web page, links in the web page, and press enter to confirm and see what happens. Are you able to quickly and with a reasonable way, uh, also reasonable logic to select everything in every uh, web page and to reach that uh, point 
in some website yes in other more or less in other no so this is an issue because if you cannot use a mouse obviously you cannot access to the website so again remember we we, we spoke about principle and methodology now we are speaking about accessibility that is more a set of standards and guidelines so something a little bit more low level than uh, principle the second issue that again in 2020 we have is that only a very small percentage of videos embedded in website and multimedia content have caption or good quality caption so again if you uh, have some hearing problem you cannot watch a video because you don't don't listen what the, what is doing during the video I, including probably also these lectures on on youtube we don't provide captions so we are part of this problem uh, we are not providing captions uh, we are relying on the automatic caption of, of youtube but maybe it worked well maybe not it, we, we never check actually and this is could be a problem actually yeah i, I recognize that this could be a problem uh, that and, and we are contributing to this only a very small percentage of video has been captioned um, even if automatic caption are are quite useful and work quite well Nowadays are not perfect, but work quite well. And also very few websites, and this is much more problematic than the first two points, are fully usable by people who are blind by using this uh, screen reader. Uh, because typically people don't put alternative text in the image or put alternative text that has meaningless and, and other things like this. But again, when thinking about web accessibility, uh, we should think that uh, not only web accessibility encompass all the kind of disabilities that uh, may affect the access to the web. So auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical, motor, speech, visual, etc. But also impede people that have some situational or temporary impairments in doing that. If you broke your leg in your main hand, and you cannot use a mouse, how can you navigate on a website if you cannot use the mouse? If the mouse is only for people who are, uh, who's the right hand for, uh, for instance, for, for navigating, you are not used to use your left hand if you broke your uh, right arm. And so you have to move the mouse from the other side, but it's, it's difficult and it's the website supporting these difficulties or if the website providing alternative ways for and again we we are more in the inclusive design domain alternative ways of enabling you with that you have a harm broken to navigate the website with ease or not and so the answer is typically not so accessibility is a topic that should should be uh, take hold in in web application courses uh, they don't typically so we, we we are and we don't have time nor and it is partially also out of topic for for us going in deep in the guidelines but at least we would like to tell you that some guidelines exist and more or less how they work and so that if, if and then they they are applied to the html so and to javascript uh, scripts in the browser so they uh, are addition are specific attributes typically on the things that you already know and you already know how to uh, to modify or to create on the web. So, uh, which are the set the components that ever a play in web accessibility? Uh, there are three main components that work together and are also intertwined together. There is the web content per se. There is text. There is images, there is forms, multimedia, JavaScript, files on the browser, and so on. And all of these can have some attributes. So text, for instance, is the easiest one because uh, it, every computer is able, for instance, to read the text. Images are more complex for people who uh, cannot hear. And images can also be comple complicated for people who um, have some problems in, in seeing colors, for instance. Maybe they get the, the concept, but maybe 
in some cases, they don't get the full image uh, per se. And the scripts can change things in the page dynamically, so it can also in change content, so I have an impact on content. Videos, we, we already said videos before. Forms, buttons on the forms should be, uh, all the labels should be uh, equipped with alternatives, with a title, so that uh, also a people who, who is blind, a person who is blind can know what is in the form and that, that is a password field. And so it doesn't expect the, the screen reader or software to read the password out loud. In, in speakers because it's a password field. So the, the, the software behave different from the, the address field. And then there is the user agent. So where you are using that content? You are using that content in a browser and desktop, in a voice browser, that is a browser without screen at all, in a mobile browser, so that has different screen and maybe it's responsive the web applications. So some parts are not there. And if they are not visible, it should not be, for instance, again, in the case of people who are blind, it should not be read because they are not on the screen and, and so on. And then the third element is authoring tools. So code editors. So if you are creating an HTML page, a static HTML page, you are the developer responsible to put the alternative text to the image, for instance. But if you're using a content manager system like WordPress or others, uh, maybe it's not the developer uh, who is creating the specific news or the specific blog post to be put on a website. Maybe it's just a secretary or it's just um, a person that is passionate on a specific topic that set up a blog and has no knowledge about uh, technology or web programming in general. So it's the content manager system that should provide easily option to include these things and enforce these guidelines in some way. Etc. So these are three components, web content, where the components is seeing or deployed or listened to, and the tool that creates that content. They should support all this thing. And for accessibility in the web, there exists an initiative of W3C that is called the Web Accessibility Initiative that is uh, quite old initiative and is still uh, useful and active. And, and this WAI, Web Accessibility Initiative, provides a set of guidelines for accessibilities. Guidelines and suggest some tools to check that your web application is following the guidelines. So you can follow the guidelines during the uh, the design, the development, but you can also check with some automatic tools that some of these guidelines are respected, given that most of them are about uh, HTML, most of them are about changing HTML uh, attributes. So these are guidelines for enabling people to access information and data in, and uh, activities on the web. And so these are four, four guidelines. The first one is the WCIG, is the Web Content Accessibility Guideline is probably the most used and famous of the, of the three of them. Uh, and it's something that is useful for developer and, and users in creating web page and editing web page. Then the other two are more about the user agent and authoring tools. So what authoring tools and user agents and browser should support for enabling guidelines? For enabling accessibility, because obviously, if you uh, you can set the alternative text of an image, but the browser is not considering that attributes, and that that is a standard attributes in HTML5, and the, your content manager system is not uh, traducing that field in HTML or does not present the field in the graphical user interface, it's it's useless again to have. So you are not fulfilling these for for due to a, a, missing, a missing thing in the authoring tool. So these are the guidelines, more or less. The first one related to the content. The second is about user agent accessibility. That is for people who are creating browsers and so on. The authoring tools is more for people who are creating authoring tools like content menu system. And uh, then there is something that is a little bit new while the uh, WCAG exists from years and years and years and is working towards the version three, uh, 
this this last one the area attributes for accessible or rich internet application are a little bit newer and are related to all the function that javascript in the browser allowed us to have in recent times so all the single page application features all these capabilities interactive capabilities that uh, javascript enabled and since these are capabilities that are not maybe in html or that can be generate some html so you can set some attributes directly there is a series of guidelines uh, in this case, specific attributes are called aria minus something or something minus aria uh, for making rich internet application accessible. And these guidelines are also adopted in laws. For instance, the Italian law that's called Act Stank, uh, Act, Stanca Act, uh, the, the Legge Stanca. Uh, of 1994 and modification and updates uh, promotes accessibility of information technologies and basically say you have to follow the Vucia G 2.1 uh, that was the, the latest Vucia G consolidated Vucia G guideline that we have so series two of the guidelines for checking and also recommend and mandate that public administration website follow these guidelines so that they are accessible. And you see, this is not something about how you design the website. It's just a check as something that you put after to verify that some attributes of accessibility are there and are working well. And then maybe you are excluding a lot of people, but at least uh, what you have is accessible according to the standards, according to the guidelines and so on. And, and most of these are, these are obviously international and they are adopted in Italian law, but also at the European level, and they're adopted, and in many countries, they are adopted and referenced directly to the WCAG uh, guidelines. So briefly, uh, just for uh, giving you a, an overview of how WCAG is made, and then uh, if you click here on this link, you can go on the website where there are all these principles, uh, all these guidelines. So basically, the WCAG are split in different uh, items. Uh, you have some categories that they call principle. Then you have guidelines related to these, uh, these principles like provide a meaningful uh, text alternative for images. Uh, the element should be adaptable. Uh, all the website should be accessible with keyboard. So if you don't have mouse, you can use the website only with a keyboard. Uh, Everything should be readable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then defines for each guideline, for, for most of the guidelines, three level. Uh, typically the contrast is another thing. So the should, you should provide a sufficient contrast between the background information and the, and the foreground information. So you cannot write black on, on a gray background because there is not enough contrast. Uh, that in general, but in particular, uh, this also apply. And, and these are the three levels, uh, typically, where the level A is the easiest one, and the level AAA is the hardest one. And the recommendation for most of these guidelines is to fulfill the level AA. That is, that includes all the previous level, obviously, and add something more specific. So for instance, in the contrast, if you fulfill so a proper contrast between the background color, the foreground color, like the image or the color of the, of the screen, of the page and the text on the screen, uh, if you fulfill level AA, you cover uh, like 90% or 95% of uh, accessibility issues. If you cover the AAA, you are covering probably 100% or 99.99. But level, level AA is just really good. So it's recommended to at least stick with level AA in most of these guidelines. Obviously, if you want to uh, follow the level, the level AAA, it's better. But in some cases, it's also limiting for some uh, choices, like in colors and level AAA, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to, to select there is not a, a, a lot of range of color that respects the, the, the level AAA and that also pleasant to see for 
for everybody. And just to give you, so this is the, no, this is the video, this is the website. And if you go, for instance, here, how to meet WCAG, you see here all the guidelines, you can see the full description. So for instance, uh, let's have a look at the, use of color, for instance, uh, use of color. Uh, and then you have a series of technique and link to other guidelines to say, for instance, if the color of particular words, the ground, the other content is used to indicate information. So it's not just decorative, but convey information, ensure a content storage of three to one with surrounding text. Uh, including a text view for color form control level. So if the, this is in, in a form, uh, if it's in a, within an image to convey information within an image using specific color and pattern, you can click here and you can see some techniques and description uh, with some example on how to do this. And on the website, you should you also have somewhere some tools for checking um, You see here also the, the area things and uh, you, you in the website, there is also some tools for checking the, uh, the, the, that the website is respecting these guidelines. Also, for instance, Chrome as a, uh, I think in Lighthouse, yeah, you can generate an accessibility report for either mobile and desktop. So you can generate a report for a website. I hope this website is fully accessible. Yeah, obviously uh, it's 100% accessible and you can also see the items that you need to manually check if you want, uh, because they cannot be checked uh, automatically and all the check that were done and passed. So for instance, all the area attributes or document as a title document, as a title element and with a brief explanation. So there are also some automatic tools to help you uh, in uh, uh, checking that most of the accessibility guidelines are met. Okay, do you have any questions since we are out of time? Okay, while you think about questions or if you don't have a question, I'll stop recording and um, to, tomorrow we will have a new lab that is about wireframes. So you are asking, you, we are asking you to create a wireframe of your selective prototype. And next week you will do in groups. So one group with other, with another groups, the uh, heuristic evaluation of your wireframe. So the wireframe that you are creating tomorrow is needed to be, it should be re ready for use by next week but more on this tomorrow in the lab and in the text of the lab for tomorrow and next week.